Okay, welcome back. Today we have four poems we're going to be looking at. Latin Women Pray, Bitch, My Wicked Wicked Ways, and Hazel Tells Laverne. So first let's start with Latin Women Pray by Judith Ortiz Kofer. Latin women pray in incense sweet churches. They pray in Spanish to an Anglo God with a Jewish heritage. And this great white father, imperturbable in his marble pedestal, looks down upon his brown daughters, boat of candles shining like lust in his all-seeing eyes, unmoved by their persistent prayers. Yet year after year, before his image they kneel, Margarita, Josefina, Maria, and Isabel, all fervently hoping that if not omnipotent, at least he be bilingual. Okay, so let's, uh, let's unpack this poem uh, as it moves along. Latin women pray in, so we're talking about mostly Catholicism, right? And so they pray in incense sweet churches. They pray in Spanish to an Anglo God, so to a white God with a Jewish heritage, meaning that uh, Christianity is actually an offshoot of Judaism. The, uh, the New Testament is built upon the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the Jewish heritage. So much of what's going on in this poem, of course, is sort of religious-based, but I would also say that it is class-based as well. They are taught that to get what they want, they need to pray. And whom are they praying to? They're praying to an Anglo God, but they pray in Spanish, okay? And even Spanish is a European language that was imported, right? And this great white father, imperturbable in his marble pedestal, means imperturbable is can't be bothered, isn't bothered looks down upon his brown daughters, votive candles shining like lust in his all-seeing eyes, unmoved by their persistent prayers. Now, I don't believe in a God. I don't think any religion believes in a God that looks down upon uh, his brown daughters, okay? My vision of a God is not one who looks down upon his brown daughters, who treats his brown daughters with any less love than uh, any of the other of his daughters or children, okay? but. And, and I don't think that that's what's going on here. I think instead that this is the perception the Latin women have as they pray to this Anglo God, this white God. Uh, I think they are taught to look at themselves as if they are worthy, of, that they should be looked down upon even by God. Okay, and that's what makes this poem to me not just religious, but also political and cultural. Because... I don't think God looks down on his brown daughters, but I think sometimes his brown daughters are taught to feel as if he does, and that he is unmoved by their persistent prayers. Now, what would make his brown daughters think that he's unmoved by their persistent prayers? Well, because likely the prayers are unanswered. They're persistent, they're going on and on, but the prayers are unanswered. Yet, they don't stop praying. Year after year, uh, before his image, they kneel, uh, Margarita, Josefina, Maria, and Isabel. Okay, so four different women and others. These are just a random sample of names. All fervently hoping that if not omnipotent, that means all powerful, at least he'd be bilingual. So the Christian God is one whom uh, we are told is omnipotent, meaning all powerful. And so the Latin women doubt at the end of this poem. They're hoping that if he is not omnipotent, Okay, so that they're doubting maybe he's not all-powerful. And why would they think that? Well, because their prayers are going unanswered. So they're, they are thinking maybe he can't answer all prayers. They at least hope that if he cannot answer all prayers, at least he can understand them. At least he is bilingual. So here we have Latin women praying, praying to a white god, praying in Spanish, which is an imported language, and it's an imported religion too, imported in this case in Spanish from Spain, and we have Latin women praying fervently, but obviously not having their prayers answered. Otherwise, they wouldn't keep praying and praying and praying. Otherwise, in the end, they wouldn't doubt that God may not be all-powerful, and in fact, he may not even be bilingual. He may not even understand. And so you have these Latin women who are told or taught, uh, to get what you want in this world, you need to pray. So that's what, to me, makes it social, uh, cultural, uh, political, as well as religious, this poem. Because I don't know that it makes a lot of sense uh, to say if you your life isn't going as you want it to and you're struggling and you're having a hard life, that what you need to do is to pray harder and pray more fervently. 
uh, and hope at least if, that God is bilingual. It seems to me that that is sort of an excuse given to Latin women so that they don't do other things to make their lives better, such as, I don't know, uh, <laughs> storm the castle, do things, demand from the larger culture their their rights, demand uh, that their grievances be heard. But instead, it seems that these women are taught to look down upon themselves and imagine a God who looks down upon them, who may not even be listening or understanding them at all. He may be unmoved. He's imperturbable. But ultimately, this is really their only way of making their lives better. And so their prayers go unanswered. Their lives don't get better. Okay, let's look at another poem. Uh, this time, let's look at Caroline Kaiser's Bitch. Now when he and I meet, after all these years, I say to the bitch inside me, don't start growling. He isn't a trespasser anymore, just an old acquaintance tipping his hat. My voice says, nice to see you, as the bitch starts to bark hysterically. He isn't an enemy anymore. Where are your manners, I say, as I say, how are the children? They must be growing up. At a kind word from him, it looked like the old days. The bitch changes her tone. She begins to whimper. She wants to snuggle up to him, to cringe. Down, girl. Keep your distance, or I'll give you a taste of the choke chain. Fine. I'm just fine, I tell him. She slobbers and grovels. After all, I am her mistress. She is basically loyal. It's just that she remembers how he came running each evening when she heard his step, how she lay at his feet and looked up adoringly, though he was absorbed in his paper, or bored with her devotion, ordered her to the kitchen until he was ready to play. But the small careless kindnesses, when he had a good day or a couple of drinks, come back to her now even seem more um, important than the casual cruelties, the ultimate dismissal. It's nice to know you are doing well, I say. He couldn't have taken you with him. You were too demonstrative, too clumsy, not like the well-groomed pets of his new friends. Give my regards to your wife, I say. You gag as I drag you off by the scruff, saying, goodbye, goodbye, nice to see you again. Okay, so what if I told you there's a poem called Bitch about this woman who meets her ex-boyfriend or ex-husband after a certain amount of time, and maybe it wasn't a very good uh, breakup, uh, you're going to say, oh, this is going to be good. She's really going to let him have it. But of course, the bitch in the title is referring to a female dog, and it's not a real-life female dog. It's sort of her inner feelings, um, this sort of inner female dog living within her. Okay, so when they meet after all these years, her first reaction is to growl. Okay, so it's an angry, her inner emotions um, have a first sort of an angry response. Okay, but there's a difference between what's going on inside of us, what's going on inside of her, and what actually is coming out of her mouth. What comes out of her mouth is, oh, nice to see you. How are the children? They must be growing up. Fine. I'm just fine. Uh, it's nice to know you're doing well. So just the sort of common nice day we're having. How about this weather? Just sort of common uh, nothing sort of conversation she's having on the outside. And meanwhile, on the inside, she's got this dog barking hysterically. Uh, where are your manners? And so she's trying to, you can imagine, maintain this uh, facade. Uh, maintain this idea that um, she's doing fine, everything's great, but of course inside of her, her emotions are barking hysterically like a dog. Now, so that's the first reaction, is anger, hostility, right? But then, at a kind word from him, it looked like the old days, the bitch changes her tone, she begins to whimper, she wants to snuggle up to him to cringe. So now there's this shift, after he says something perhaps kind, Everything shifts. It's not anger and hostility anymore. Now she wants to snuggle up with him. She wants to get back with him, right? <laughs> and so I'm sure that this is very surprising to her. Uh, I bet if you asked her yesterday, hey, if you ever see that guy again, how are you going to react? She's going to say, oh, man, I'm, I'm going to let him have it or I won't react at all. I don't care anymore. So the anger, angry reaction is the first thing. Now it becomes something even, I don't know, potentially more, what, embarrassing? She wants to snuggle up to him to cringe. And so she's saying, ah, down girl, keep your distance or I'll, uh, I'll pull the choke chain. At which point she's saying, fine, I'm just fine. But that's just the exterior, right? She may be not so fine inside. 
Okay. And maybe she hasn't been fine for a while. She slobbers and grovels. After all, I am her mistress. She's basically loyal. It's just that she remembers how she came running each evening when she heard his step, how she lay at his feet and looked up adoringly, though he was absorbed in his paper. So almost like a loyal dog uh, come running up to him. That's the relationship they had. Okay, so I think what we're seeing here is an unequal relationship. She was more into him than he was into her. And I don't necessarily think he's a bad guy, but he sort of took advantage of that, didn't he? That he's kind of bored. She comes running like a dog and when he's, uh, he's absorbed in his paper. Or bored with her devotion, ordered her to the kitchen until he was ready to play. So again, like a dog ordering the dog away. But in this case, ordering her to the kitchen until he was ready to play. Okay, so she remembers at, you know, how... how uh, much she adored him and like a puppy looking up and really how um, he just isn't into her. But the small careless kindnesses, the little things when he had a good day or a couple of drinks come back to her now seem more important than the casual cruelty. So he was sort of casually cruel to her. Uh, I, I don't think he was, you know, physically abusive, but just the sort of casual cruelties that somebody might say to another person they just don't care about that much but there were casual cruelties maybe he forgot her birthday or their anniversary date or didn't let her know went out with some friends didn't let her know after work something like that those were casual cruelties and then there was the ultimate dismissal in other words this was the breakup and it was on his term he dismissed her and so she does what we do in situations like this, I suppose, is you just try to put on as good a face as possible. It's nice to know you're doing well, I say. And then a shift. Okay, so here to me is a, is a third shift. We started with hostility, anger, which she controls, and then this desire to get with him. She remembers all the adoration, but these, you know, this, this unequal relationship, but this seems smaller in comparison to the nice little things he did until uh, he actually ultimately dismissed her. I think then we shift to this third idea where she's blaming herself. He couldn't have taken you with him. You were too demonstrative, too clumsy. Okay, and again, like a clumsy demonstrative dog, you know, that's just too much into him. He couldn't have taken you with him. He was going places and she wasn't part of his plan. Okay, and so she's blaming herself. You were too demonstrative, too clumsy, not like the well-groomed pets of his new friends. Okay, so he has traded up to newer friends who have sort of well-groomed pets, in other words, whose interior lives are, I guess, what, more sophisticated, less demonstrative, less clumsy. And then finally, give my regards to your wife, I say. You gag as I drag you off by the scrub, because even at that moment, the dog inside of her wants to be with him, okay, and she's blaming herself, saying goodbye, goodbye, nice to have seen you again. So at, at one level, you could say, Whew, boy, that was a close one. Uh, she got away for all he knows. You know, there's nothing going on with her and uh, inside of her. And it was just this sort of casual meeting and everything's cool. So he doesn't have to feel sorry for her. Or he doesn't go home thinking, boy, she's still into me. OK, so uh, she wins the battle. The emotions, I think, don't really reveal themselves to him. She's kept it under control. So you might say that she walks away from this meeting victorious. At the same time, you know she's going to go home and think about every single minute of this. Every single, I mean, I think these emotions uh, are probably surprising her. And in some ways, she's pushed the reset button and she now is thinking about him all over again. Uh, so any healing maybe that's happened in the past is sort of like, all right, well, that, that wound is reopened. He's going to go home to his wife and won't think about this meeting again. It just won't really register with him the way it does with her. So in some ways, does he, she walk away defeated or victorious? It sort of is up to how you might read it, right? And so what is, if we were to say, okay, well, what's sort of the underlying theme or message? Uh, at one level, you could say, it's just simply the, the face that we show to the world may disguise uh, deeper emotions, deeper things that are going on inside of us. Okay, so at one level it could be that. But if we kind of make it more specific to this poem, we could say, in matters of former loves, 
I think our emotional reactions can be surprising, confusing, and maybe potentially embarrassing, right? That when we have these former loves uh, and we think that we know what emotion <laughs> we are sort of applying uh, to that particular event in our life, in this case, it seems to be kind of anger uh, and hostility when she actually sees him, these things shift. And I think what we're witnessing is sort of surprise and at least some confusion. And at least she's not outwardly embarrassed, but maybe inwardly she feels a certain amount of embarrassment. Okay? All right, off to the next one. Okay, My Wicked Wicked Ways by Sandra Cisneros. This is my father. See, he is young. He looks like Errol Flynn. He is wearing a hat that tips over one eye a suit that fits him good, and baggy pants. He is also wearing those awful shoes, the two-toned ones my mother hates. Here is my mother. She is not crying. She cannot look into the lens because the sun is bright. The woman, the one my father knows, is not here. She does not come till later. My mother will get very mad. Her face will turn red, and she will throw one shoe. My father will say nothing. After a while, everyone will forget it. Years and years will pass. My mother will stop mentioning it. This is me. She is carrying. I am a baby. She does not know that I will turn out bad. Okay, so what's going on here? What's the, here's my father, here's, uh, this is my father, here's my mother, this is me. Well, we're looking at a photograph. This is the narrator showing a photograph to a friend, a friend close enough to know that her father has had an affair because when she says, oh, the, the woman, the one my father knows, she doesn't come till later. Okay, this is information the person uh, who is being spoken to uh, already has. So we're looking at a, a photo and it's a photo of three people, the mother, the father, and the baby. Okay, and so we're looking at the father first. This is my father, see he's young, looks like Errol Flynn, a very, very handsome uh, uh, movie star. He's wearing a hat that tips over one eye, a suit that fits him good, and baggy pants. So he is uh, dressed to kill. He's trying to look good. He's trying to look sharp. Okay, he's got the hat rakishly tipped over one eye. The suit fits him good. He's got the baggy pants, which was the style at the time. He is also wearing those awful shoes, the two-tone ones my mother hates. So he's wearing sort of flashy two-tone shoes, uh, and the mother hates them. And you can think, well, why does the mother hate the, those shoes? Well, likely she doesn't like the way he's dressed at all. He's dressed like a person who is trying to attract female attention. Okay, and she might be thinking, why are you still dressed like this? Why are you wearing those awful shoes, those awful flashy shoes? Uh, you don't need to attract attention anymore. You've got me. Okay, so next, pointing out how the father's dressed. He's dressed like he's uh, a player. Uh, here is my mother. She is not crying. She cannot look into the lens because the sun is bright. Okay, so I think if we look at the picture, we'd see the mother sort of squinting, okay? And maybe the look on her face looks like she is crying. So the narrator has to insist, oh, she's not crying. Okay, it's like, I know she looks like she's crying, but she cannot look into the lens because the sun is bright. Well, the minute you say she is not crying, it makes you picture a person crying. You picture the mother crying, don't you? If I said, uh, don't imagine a blue elephant in the room with you, the first thing you do is think of a blue elephant in the room with you, right? So to introduce the idea she is not crying, uh, and then the reason why it looks like she's crying, that, you know, she's squinting, the sun is so bright, which is sort of a, a poetic metaphor, right? At least the way she's seeing it. The sun is bright, the future looks good, but to say she's not crying tells us, okay, in this instance, she may not be crying, but she's going to have reason to cry later, okay? And so in the same stanza, and this is what tells me the person who the narrator sharing the photograph with already knows this part of the family history. The woman, the one my father knows, is not here. She does not come till later. Okay, so this is going to be the woman that um, the, her father uh, cheats on the mother with. Well, these words only make sense if the person looking at the photograph already knows about the affair. So it's almost as if the, the narrator is saying, here's a picture of my mother. I know it looks like she's crying, but it's not. The lens is really bright. The reason she will be crying later 
uh, hasn't arrived yet, and that's the woman, the one my father knows. Okay, she's going to come in later. Then we find out the reaction of the father cheating on the mother. My mother will get very mad. Her face will turn red. She will throw one shoe. I find that really interesting. She will throw one shoe. It's very specific, isn't it? It's not she will throw a shoe or she will throw two shoes. It's very specific. She will throw one shoe. Now, I don't know if the shoe she's going to throw is one of her own or maybe they're one of the two-tone shoes that she hates. Here, take take this, you know, throw a shoe at, at you. I find it kind of interesting, though, why it's not two shoes. And to me, what would two shoes mean that one shoe does not mean? One shoe, by throwing the one shoe, shoes come in pair, it might be sort of symbolic of how he has broken the pair, uh, separated the pair. I think that two shoes would have been more final. If you throw two shoes at the person, especially if they're his shoes, it's more like take your shoes and get out, right? And so throwing two shoes means uh, we're done. Throwing one shoe might mean I'm very, very upset with you, but I'm not going to break up the family or I'm not going to let you break up the family over this event. My father will say nothing. Okay. If the father was being falsely accused, he would not say nothing. The fact that he says nothing tells me he's guilty. She has him dead to right. He has no defense. After a while, everyone will forget it. Well, that's clearly not true because the narrator doesn't forget it. And I don't think the mother ever forgets it either. So she's saying, after a while, everyone will forget it as a way of saying, we will pretend as if we have forgotten it. We will just kind of bury it. Years and years will pass, my mother will stop mentioning it. So I think that everyone will forget it is, we will live our lives as if this has never happened, but nobody forgets it. Okay, and then finally, we get to this uh, short stanza, just four lines. This is me she is carrying, so there's, she's holding the baby, the baby narrator in the photograph. I am a baby, she does not know I will turn out bad. So it's hard to kind of know what that means, I will turn out bad. What does that mean? Does that mean she will turn out bad according to her mother? She will do things her mother doesn't approve of? Does it mean she turns out objectively bad, that she's a bad person? I, I don't think so. I, it's hard to look at a photo of a baby and say, oh yeah, you see that baby? Yeah, that person's going to grow up and be a bad person. It's hard to look at the baby and say, wow, that's a, that's a future bad person. I think instead, look at that final stanza in the context of the rest of the poem. It's just so small compared to what we hear about the mother and the father and their, their doings. And I think the idea is that the relationship with what, between what comes before that final stanza has everything to do with that final stanza. I can imagine a household where maybe people will stop mentioning this affair, but that trust has been broken. And I can imagine a family where that lack of trust gets visited upon the children. I can imagine a mother who is looking for signs in her daughter that she's going to turn out like the father. So if the daughter's life was negatively affected by the father's affair, and I think that's what the final stanza means. It's just that the baby who grows up to be the narrator is affected by the fact that her father cheated on her mother, negatively affected that way. Then I think maybe a message or a theme of the poem is that in cases of family betrayal, in this case, the father cheating on the mother, family betrayal doesn't just hurt one member, it hurts the entire family. You can make the case, I think, that the father wasn't just cheating on the mother, he was also cheating on the baby because her life is negatively affected by it as well. And finally, a fun one, I hope, Catherine Howard Macon's Hazel Tells Laverne. Last night I'm cleaning out my Howard Johnson's ladies room when all of a sudden up pops this frog. Must have come from the sewer, swimming around and trying to climb up the side of the bowl. So he goes to flush him down. But so help me God, he starts talking about a golden ball and how I can be a princess. Me, a princess. Well, my mouth drops all the way to the floor and he says, kiss me, just kiss me once on the nose. Well, I screams, you little green pervert, and I hits him with my mop and has to flush, them, flush the toilet down three times. Me, a princess. Okay, well, it's sort of a twist on the frog prince, right? One of the things I, I notice right away in this poem is there's no capitalization, no punctuation. And yet, at the same time, I don't think this is something 
that Hazel is reading or that Hazel sat down and wrote, I think we're supposed to hear Hazel saying this out loud to Laverne. So when we talk, there's no punctuation, there's no capitalization, but the way that it's presented makes us think that Hazel probably is, is not very well educated. She, the Howard Johnson's ladies room, Howard Johnson, it's a, it's a hotel chain, but when you say it, the Howard Johnson's, it would be a diner type or Denny's type restaurant that would be attached to the hotel. And so that restaurant would have its own ladies room. So in this poem, we see it's sort of presented almost stream of consciousness. She's in the ladies room and out pops this frog that comes from the sewer. And so she goes to flush the frog down. And then all of a sudden a frog starts talking. Now, I think that would be pretty remarkable if a frog started talking to me about how I can be a princess, me a princess. So what's really interesting here is a, a frog is talking to her and what she finds harder to believe uh, is that she could be a princess. She says, yeah, right, me a princess. Can you believe this frog? This frog is lying to me. Okay, but the frog is talking. It's a talking frog. So what should be more remarkable, of course, is, wow, this frog is talking to me. Maybe I should listen to him because this doesn't happen very often. Instead, she already disbelieves him. Yeah, right, me a princess. Well, my mouth drops all the way to the floor and he says, kiss me, just kiss me on the nose. Okay, so I guess the idea being from the old story that then he's going to turn into a prince. Well, I screams, you little green pervert. Okay, just because he wants a kiss on the nose. She, uh, I think, uh, assumes sort of the worst of this frog, thinks he's some sort of little green pervert, uh, hits him with the mop, and has to flush him down three times, and then ends with the words, re repetition, me, a princess. So is Hazel really living her best life? And I, I, I think we could objectively say, probably not. Maybe her life could have been better. But then why do we think that maybe her life is as it is, that she's doing what she was born to do, cleaning ladies' rooms at the Howard Johnson? Once upon a time, somebody held baby Hazel in their arms and said, this is my little princess. She's, you know, she's going to grow up and be wonderful. I'm not saying, yeah, right, that baby, a princess. She's going to be cleaning out Howard Johnson's ladies' rooms when she grows up. So something along the way happened, and probably Hazel... Maybe she believes she could be a princess, but somewhere along the line, uh, she has doubts. And I feel that in some ways that the that life has taught her that she cannot be a princess and she never will be a princess. And part of it is because of the limitations she puts on herself. Here she is offered this opportunity. Okay, it's crazy, it's silly, but it's an opportunity to be something other than what she is. And what is her instant reaction? Doubt. She thinks even how crazy, how impossibly miraculous a talking frog would be, she is instantly suspicious. And then when he says, okay, you got to kiss me on the nose, she assumes the worst about him, that he's a little green pervert. And then she hits him and flushes him down three times to make sure he's gone. So you see a moment, this, this miraculous opportunity that she is instantly suspicious of and uh, assumes the worst of the little green frog. Well, probably not opportunities as crazy as this, but maybe other opportunities came along in her life. Maybe a chance to live a better life. Maybe she had other opportunities of somebody else coming into her life and giving her a chance to, to do something else, to be something else, but she assumes the worst. I think her inability to believe what the frog is telling her comes from low self-esteem and lack of belief in herself that she could be anything but what she is. And so she doesn't take a chance or risks for a better life. And so, of course, that's why she remains where she is. Is there an underlying message in here? Well, maybe we could say the largest limitations in our lives are those that we place upon ourselves. Maybe something like that. Okay, that's it for today. Don't forget to take the quiz. Bye now.